and research on bobcats here in the Granite State. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I love the Hare Center and I hate that I'm so far from it now, but um, I, uh, when I first started my graduate career, one of my first public talks as a scientist was at the Harris Center. And I feel like the last few minutes of that talk, I talked a lot about how uh, the stuff that I wanted to do as a graduate student, the stuff that I you know, had aspirations of doing. And now it seems fitting to come back once that work is all done and, and kind of put a capstone on it and talk about the work that I actually did. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So thanks for the invite. Um, so today we're gonna talk about, uh, whoops, um, just a brief outline of what we're gonna talk about. The, I'm gonna talk about bobcat natural history. So by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that I can make bobcat experts out of y'all. And I'm in the South now, so I'm allowed to say y'all. Um, after that, we're gonna talk about the, mostly of this talk is gonna be about the research that we've done um, in New Hampshire, um, several different lines of research um, that started kind of before I got there, um, but, but I sort of I, you know, did a lot of the population genetics, diet and stress work. So we'll talk a lot about that. Um, and lastly, I just wanna end with why this matters. So um, that's the outline. Does that sound good? Make some good. nods, everyone can hear me good? All right, great. Um, so let's just start with a very brief history of the bobcat. Uh, Eight million years ago, um, the earth looked a lot like it does right now. Like the continents were all in the same sort of positions, right? You can see this is a map of the earth 8 million years ago. The isthmus of Panama down here hadn't quite formed yet. Um, Alaska was still connected to Russia up here, but for the most part, things were very similar, right? And that's the years ago when the ancestor of bobcats came over from Asia into North America along that land bridge, right? Um, and it probably looks something like this. This is Proloris, again, one of the um, earliest ancestors of, um, of a lot of the different um, wild cat species around the world. But they crossed the land bridge. They were the first felid to come into North America. And what they found when they got here would have been fantastic for them because there was a whole lot of really delicious, really naive prey species. Things like tiny horses, horses the size of rabbits. Um, there were early ancestors of raccoons and deer and beavers, and none of them had seen any predator with anywhere near the efficiency of Proalurus. Um, so Proalurus was a, an obligate carnivore, had a lot of the same adaptations that bobcats had that we'll talk about in a little bit, but they were just very efficient hunters. And so they were really successful um, in, in their, their, new, their new continent. So we'll fast forward a little bit to about 3 million years ago. And by this point, the Isthmus of Panama has closed off. Um, the land bridge between Europe and, and North America, Asia and North America is closed off now. So they're kind of isolated. And um, that uh, Proalurus cat diverged into a few different lineages of, of modern day cats, right? The ones that kind of were down in the Southern part of the range in Central and South America would eventually evolve into what we know of as pumas or cougars, right? Mountain lions. The ones that stayed up toward the more northern part of the range um, evolved to those really cold snowy temperatures, uh, snowy uh, habitats were the Canada lynx, right? But the ones that evolved right here in what would become the United States were the bobcats. So I like to think of the bobcats as the all American cats, right? Um, so that's just sort of a, a very brief history of of the bobcat, what's really striking, so if I, can I, um, I don't know if I can go back here, this green area that's outlined is the range of the bobcat. So you can basically see that they go from east to west coast, they go from up into Canada all the way down to Mexico, and think about the different habitats that um, that, that area encompasses, right? Like I, I can think about it because it's very recent in my head. I used to live in, in uh, New, New Hampshire a year ago, and now I'm living in Southern Arkansas, I can tell you they're very different climates, but bobcats can thrive in all those different areas. Think of the, the um, American Southwest, the very dry deserts, right? Um, and think of up into um, 
British Columbia up here, the high Rocky Mountains, they can do well there. So they're extremely adaptable and they've been a very, very successful species. So that's one of the hallmarks of bobcats, their adaptability and their success. Um, so I just want to give some, some quick fast facts. The average bobcat is only about 15 to 20 pounds. And a lot of people are kind of surprised to hear that because you, you think of a bobcat, you see pictures of bobcats, in your mind, it's probably bigger than it actually is. They're not that much bigger than a big house cat, right? That's the average bobcat. Of course, they can get a lot bigger. And I think the um, one of the record largest bobcats, I'm pretty sure it was 53 pounds from somewhere around the, uh, the Kingston, New Hampshire area. So um, they tend to be a little bit larger in the northern parts of their range than in the southern parts of their range, but an average bobcat is really not that big. Um, it's a fancy word here, they're crepuscular, which means that they're most active around dawn and dusk. So the couple hours leading up to sunset and a couple hours after sunset and the same thing uh, at sunrise in the morning are their peak activity hours. That's when they like to hunt, that's when they're out and about the most. They can be active at all times of the day and night. It's just that they're most likely to be active at, at those times. Um, they have a highly varied diet and we'll talk a little bit more about, about their diet when we get into the research part, but um, they're obligate carnivores, so they have to eat meat. Their digestive system is designed to be really efficient at digesting meats. They can't just go out like a coyote can, and if they can't catch a good meal, um, you know, eat some berries or eat some vegetation. Um, they're not going to get nutrition from that, so they have to eat have to eat meat. And depending on where they are in their range, whether uh, you know what kind of habitats they're they're in, um, they can eat lots of different things. Um, we'll talk about up in New England. They like to eat other mammals. They like to eat squirrels and rabbits and things like that. In other parts of their range in the desert southwest, um, there was even a video of, um, I think it was in Florida, of a bobcat pulling a shark out of the ocean and eating it a, a few years ago. So they have a, a highly varied diet, but it's, um, it, it's really, they're, they're obligate carnivores. They have to eat meat. Um, they live about six to eight years. And actually a, a six, seven, eight year old bobcat in the wild is a really old bobcat. The average age might be even less than that. So they don't live very long in the wild. In captivity, they can live a lot longer. They, it's uh, pretty common for them to live 20 plus years in captivity. Um, again, I think the, the record for oldest lived bobcat is about 32 years, um, at one that was living in a zoo. I wanna say it was in Ohio. Um, <clears throat> But they can live a lot longer in captivity in those sort of constant conditions where they're fed, uh, you know, they're, they're not exposed to the elements. And the reason for that huge disparity, you know, a wild bobcat living five years and a, a captive bobcat living 20 or 30 years is basically just because it's really hard to be a bobcat. It's really hard to live in the wild, especially if you're an obligate carnivore that has to go out and catch your own food, right? So I, I have this picture down here of this, um, the teeth of a five-year-old male bobcat. There's a couple things to notice. First of all, this canine right here is completely missing, right? Um, those canines have really deep roots. So to, to knock out a canine, it has to be a pretty severe blow, right? Um, so that was, that was a pretty significant event in the life of this bobcat. This canine down here looks like it's kind of chopped in half. There's supposed to be six incisors right there. There's only three. Um, so, so it's tough, you know, like when you have to go out and, and catch your own food, every, all the things that you require nutrition wise to live your life really don't want you to live your life, right? They're, they're going to fight you tooth and nail. Um, so in, in that situation, if you're injured, that's, uh, you know, a really fast track to starvation. If you, um, you know, sprain your ankle or break your leg or something, it's gonna be really hard for you to survive. So that's why um, in, ca in captivity, bobcats can live a lot longer than they typically do in wild. Um, they're ambush hunters. They're not like the cheetahs you might see on, on the Discovery Channel or on uh, some documentary where they can just go, you know, sprint at full speed and chase down their prey. They can run pretty fast, but over very short distances. So their strategy is um, camouflage. They have that nice, pretty coat, um, sort of that brownish, um, reddish color that helps them um, kind of stay hidden in a lot of different habitats. Um, in fact, the bobcat's scientific name, Lynx rufus, uh, 
Rufus actually means red. So they get their name from that reddish kind of rusty tint to their coat that helps them uh, be camouflaged. Um, so they're gonna sit there, try to hide, try to be very still and try to wait for something to come by that's within striking distance um, that, that they can just kind of nab. That's their hunting strategy. Um, in, in terms of behavior, in the wild, they're mostly solitary. If you ever see more than one bobcat together in the same place at the same time, more than likely you're seeing a mother with um, the kittens that she gave birth to the, the prior year. So that's just some, some, some basic bobcat uh, biology right there. Um, and you know, continuing with this, uh, this mostly solitary thing, I say mostly because a mother might be with her kittens, but then there's also mating season. This is one of my favorite bobcat, bobcat facts here. Um, the breeding season starts right about on Valentine's Day. So they're feeling the love in the air. Um, and that's when males and females, which typically, you know, they're solitary, so they don't really see each other too much, but they'll come together um, right around the middle of February until about the middle of March, sometime in that window. And they'll, um, and they'll mate and then they'll kind of go their separate ways. And that's pretty much the end of their association, right? Um, so that's typically what happens in the northern parts of their range, like New Hampshire, uh, where, where y'all are living. Um, in other parts of their range, the breeding season can last a whole lot longer. And the reason for that is in the north, there's a lot of pressure for, um, for wildlife species, for animals to sync up their reproduction with the seasonal cycles, right? Like you don't wanna be having your babies as the, the harsh winter is about to hit. You wanna have your babies as close as possible to when spring hits so that they can, uh, when all those, when, when the flowers start to bloom and, um, and you know, spring has sprung, right? That's when you take part in abundance and they can also have that nice long summer growing season to kind of grow up and get strong and, and you know, kind of figure out what it means to be a bobcat, right? So in the Northern part of their range, um, breeding season is, is really kind of a small window, but down where I am in Arkansas, um, you might see bobcats breeding, um, you know, in, in January, February, even uh, into May, um, maybe even multiple times a year if, if the first litter is unsuccessful. Um, so after that, mom's gonna carry the babies for about eight weeks, that's the gestation period. Then um, most bobcat moms will have two kittens, so they'll have twins. Um, they can have as many as four. Uh, sometimes they might just have one, but, but two is about the average number of kittens that are born in late April, early May. Um, and by about eight weeks old, they'll be weaned, but they'll spend their pretty much their entire first year with mom where she's teaching them how to hunt, kind of taking care of, uh, taking care of them. Um, after that first year, when the next breeding season comes around, that's typically when they're gonna be sort of kicked out of, kicked out of mom's house and they're off on their own. That's what we biologists like to call the dispersal phase, right? Um, so once, uh, once they're about a year old, mom's gonna kick them out of the home range and they have to go set up their own home range um, because they're, they're solitary critters. Mom doesn't want them to be around uh, for too much longer, especially if she's gonna go mate and have another litter. Um, so they're gonna go, they're gonna travel through the landscape. They might travel a half a mile down the road and kind of set up shop there. They might travel hundreds of miles. There's lots of things that, that go into, um, you know, how far an animal is going to disperse. There, there are definitely some stories of bobcats traveling some really far distances, um, depending on some, some habitat factors. They're looking for a habitat that looks similar to where they were raised, so they know how to, you know, function in that habitat. Um, and they're looking for a habitat that no other bobcat is, is sort of living in at the time. And that can be kind of challenging. Because as I mentioned a couple of times, they're, they're solitary, right? So they have these home ranges that they defend pretty fiercely, especially females. So if we look at um, this sort of diagram here off on the left, this polygon right here is gonna represent sort of the home range of one female. Here's the home range of another female. And there might be a little bit of overlap, but you're probably not gonna see both of those females in this overlap area at the same time. Um, so they, they pretty fiercely defend those, those territories. Um, and the reason for that is, remember that moms are the only ones to care for, those, for their kittens, right? So not only does her home range 
have to support, have to have enough resources to support herself, but she has to secure enough resources to keep two other bobcats probably, um, you know, fed and, and healthy. So they're gonna defend those resources. They're gonna defend those territories um, pretty vigorously. Males on the other hand, they're, they're not quite as territorial. So a male home range, first of all, tends to be a lot bigger. So they, they patrol a much larger area. Um, and they're not as picky as females as to like, you know, who else is allowed on their, on their territory. Um, they'll, their home range will probably overlap with a couple other females that, that he might mate with uh, during mating season. There might even be some overlap with another male's territory over here because the, the, it's, it's such a large area, it's really hard for them to patrol the whole thing, right? So there's probably more overlap in males, but females definitely, um, you know, pretty vigorously defend their home ranges. There's not a whole lot of overlap. And to give you an idea of how big a female home range is, I put this map here. So it's about, um, on average in New Hampshire, about 10 square miles is the average area that a female bobcat will roam. And so to give you some perspective here, here's Keene, here's Keene State College. You know, hopefully you guys are familiar with, with the Keene area. This area I've kind of highlighted in blue is about a 10 square mile area. So an average female is going to have this size home range. Um, so that's, that's pretty big, 10 square miles. Okay, so unless you've been living under a rock or maybe you're not, maybe there's some people out there in Zoom land who are not uh, you know, from New England or from New Hampshire. Um, but for those of you that are, I'm sure you've heard over the past uh, you know, five or six years that bobcats are back in New Hampshire. Right? Like they're, um, there was a while in the, in the 1980s when New Hampshire Fish and Game estimated that there was fewer than 200 bobcats in the entire state, and maybe a lot fewer than 200 bobcats in the entire state. Since then, you know, since the 2000s, we've seen story after story of bobcats coming back, right? Bobcat sightings are on the rise. Why are bobcats returning to New Hampshire? It was, it was big news, right? Um, and even more recently, we see some things like that. That was good news, right? That was good news when we just knew that bobcats were back in the landscape because they were so close to, to just being eliminated from New Hampshire. But even more recently, we see things like this. 80-year-old woman has to use a sickle to fight off a rabid bobcat. Um, I think this one was in Manchester. Police find bobcat on Burger King roof. Um, bobcat on the loose in Seabrook. Keene State students cautioned about bobcat on campus. So. It's pretty obvious from all these headlines and, uh, and from you know, lots of information out there that, that bobcats have made a, a huge comeback in New Hampshire. They're pretty abundant on the landscape. Um, and when we started to see these trends um, in you know, the late 2000s, around 2010 maybe, uh, we had some questions. We wanted to know why, like what made them so successful? What allowed them to rebound so well in the state? And so we, we at UNH started um, our bobcat research, uh, which went on for, um, for about a decade, kind of wrapping up now. But um, one of the first questions we had was, was why, is there, why are they back? Um, what's allowing them to, to come back? What's this obvious increase that we see? What's causing that? And so one of the first things we wanted to do was assess the habitat of bobcats. We didn't really know much about where bobcats like to live, right? So we wanted to figure that out. And to do that, we captured a whole bunch of bobcats. We put these little um, transmitter collars on them. Um, and this little box right here can hook up to a satellite. It's basically a GPS unit. It can hook up to a satellite. And every so often, every hour or so, it's gonna ping that satellite with the bobcat's location. So we can track that bobcat around New Hampshire, figure out exactly where it is every hour for you know, six months or a year. So we get a whole lot of information about where bobcats are spending their time. And then, um, so each one of these little black dots on this map here is one ping from the bobcat's collar to a satellite. So at a certain day and time, that bobcat was, was right here, right? Um, then we can kind of put that onto the landscape. Um, this map that I have here, um, each different color represents a different type of land cover. So this dark green is a, um, is a coniferous forest, like a pine forest. The lighter green is a hardwood forest. 
Um, the blue color is water, the red color is a city, the pink color is like low density um, human development. This might be a road right here. The brown, um, I think the, the yellow is agriculture, the brown is like a um, like a pasture maybe. But you get the idea. These have lots of different um, types of, of landscapes and we can look at what types of landscapes the bobcat's hanging out in. And if it didn't matter to this animal what kind of place it was living, you would expect it, you know, the, the um, availability of that habitat type on the landscape to be roughly equal to how the bobcat's using it, right? So if there's 20% um, of this landscape that's in pine forest, you would expect about 20% of the bobcat pings to come from pine forest, right? But we don't see that because they have they have habitat preferences. They like to live in certain areas um, uh, instead of others, right? So we were able to do this at a very large scale and kind of extrapolate it to the entire state. So I'll show you an example here. So these are these were six variables that we looked at. We wanted to see. Um, relative to roads, streams, ruggedness, steepness, were bobcats uh, liking to spend time in these areas or other areas? And so this works better in person probably, but I can see some of your faces. So um, we're gonna have a little guessing game. I'm gonna give you the first one. This uh, map up here is land cover, right? So what kind, of, um, what kind of forest, what kind of wetland, what kind of whatever. Um, we found out that bobcats really like to spend more time in wetlands than wetlands were available, right? So they had a strong preference for, wet, for wetlands and for early successional shrubby habitat. They didn't like to hang out in cities or in open water, like probably not shocking to anyone. So that's, that's what we found out for land cover. Wetlands and shrubby habitat were their two favorites. Cities and open water, their two least favorites. How about Yes or no? Do you think bobcats like to live in lots of roads? Any head shakers out there? No, they did not like roads. Oh, I like that. Yeah, we can do the thumbs up, thumbs down thing too. Um, so yeah, they did not like to be near roads. Again, probably pretty obvious. How about streams? Did they like to be in or near streams? Yeah, yeah, they did. And like there's a lot of riparian corridors. That's sort of the fancy word of like the nice vegetation that often accompanies the sides of streams, right? Very diverse um, vegetative community often leads to a very diverse um, animal community. Good prey for bobcats, right? So they really like the streams. How about steepness? Did they like to live in very steep areas or not so steep areas? Anybody out there? No, they actually did like the steep areas. And I think this, this probably has to do with, think of a, of a very steep area. There's gonna be lots of like craggy, cliff facey type of things. Well, bobcats like to live in dens. That's where they're gonna find shelter. That's where, gonna, where they're going to rest during the day or during the evening. And steep areas like that are gonna provide lots of shelter, um, lots of denning opportunities, especially for maybe mom and her kittens. So I think steepness probably had something to do with, with just the, um, the shelter requirement that, that bobcats had. The next one, ruggedness. If you think of like a, a big flat parking lot, that's gonna have a really low ruggedness. If you think of like a boulder field, there's lots of crags and, and you know, um, lots of just like sharp points. Do you think bobcats liked that or did they, did, did they like more rugged landscapes? They sure did. They're ambush hunters, right? The more, the more variation there is in that landscape, the more places they're gonna to have to hide, the more places it gives their prey to hide. So the prey are gonna be more abundant in those areas. Um, so yeah, bobcats really liked the, the ruggedness. How about high elevation? Do you think they liked living on Mount Washington? Nah, not so much. So they like to hang out in those low areas, the low wetland areas. Um, and if we put all this together, so we can look at all these different variables at the statewide scale, figure out like to what degree bobcats liked all of these and using some fancy statistical mathematical mapping stuff, which I'm not gonna get into the details of, we came up with a habitat suitability map for all of New Hampshire that looks like this. So areas that are very green are really, really good bobcat habitat. Areas that are really red, really not so great bobcat habitat. 
and areas that are yellow are you know, somewhere in between. So on a scale of zero to one, how good is this habitat? And if you'll notice, you know, pretty much everything south of the White Mountains is, is you know, at least marginally good habitat, but most of it's pretty, pretty darn good habitat, right? Um, even some stuff north of the White Mountains is, is actually really good habitat. So, um, so what we learned was that a vast majority of the state is gonna do pretty well at supporting this bobcat population. And so that was really one of the reasons that, that we think that they really came back was um, this habitat that, um, that was really able to, to support their numbers. <clears throat> so at the same time, this bobcat population was rebounding really, really well. Tons of good habitat on the land. We also have a whole lot of human influence growing on the land, right? So um, this is, these areas in orange and yellow on this map are what we call the wildland urban interface. And this is basically an area that is, has a certain density of human housing and human development that lies within or within a small distance of large continuous, um, like good, good wildlife habitat, right? So um, this is a good, like th these wild and urban interfaces, these are good areas for um, potential for human wildlife interactions, potential conflicts, things like that, right? And if we look at New Hampshire and Vermont, both in terms of the amount of the percentage of land area and the percent of the population, um, New Hampshire and Vermont are well, well, well above the national average um, in those areas. So um, roughly 40% of the land area of Vermont and New Hampshire is within this wildland urban interface. The US average is only 10. Um, and in terms of human population, um, seven or eight out of every 10 people in Vermont and New Hampshire live within that wildland urban interface. Um, it's only about three out of 10 on average in the, in the US. So for actions in wildlife and humans in New Hampshire and Vermont. We've also seen over the last you know, 60 or 70 years, some really significant population growth, especially in New Hampshire. So we have this situation where bobcats are back, they're, they're flourishing, but the landscape looks really different than it did the last time they were really abundant um, in New Hampshire. So that was sort of what spurred um, the sort of next phase of research that we went into. And the first thing we wanted to ask was um, how, how are bobcats able to use this landscape um, to go through that dispersal phase, right? Dispersal is a really important part of any wildlife species. How well can they move from one area to another is gonna dictate how successful that population is gonna be. So we were interested in, in, is the human influence on the landscape interfering? So, so we could study that using genetics. So just a um, quick disclaimer here, I'm not going to get into like any super detail of like the methods of, of these, uh, these next few studies, but I'm just going to show you kind of like some really cool, important results that we found. Uh, we were able to sample a whole bunch of bobcats thanks to, you know, our collaborators with New Hampshire Fish and Game, Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and, and other agencies in Massachusetts and Quebec and Maine. Um, so we sampled a whole lot of bobcats and, and used genetics to learn quite a few interesting things. So the population in New Hampshire is not one continuous population. It turns out that it's kind of like two different subpopulations that there's not a whole lot of dispersal going on between the two. There's some, but there's not, there's not as much as you would expect, right? And um, we were able to use a collection of skulls from them that were collected in the 1950s we extracted DNA from them and got a snapshot of what that population structure looked like historically. We were able to collect a whole bunch of, of contemporary bobcats as well and get a snapshot of what it looks like now after all that um, you know, development on the landscape and the huge increase in human population. And we could compare the two. And basically what we found was that there was uh, two subpopulations in the historic population kind of separated by this, this dotted line here. So north of the White Mountains was one subpopulation, south of the White Mountains was another subpopulation. That was the historic um, 
the historic bobcats. In the contemporary bobcats, we saw a similar thing where there were two different subpopulations. But if you'll notice, this, this boundary between the two has shifted a lot farther south. So that's one main difference um, between them. The other really uh, important thing that we found was that gene flow was not um, equal back and forth between the two populations. Historically, most gene flow was happening from the southern part of the state up into the northern part of the state. So the southern part of the state was really productive. The you know, bobcats were, were mating really well down here. They're really healthy and happy. And when their young went to disperse, they didn't have anywhere to go because all the home ranges were taken up. So they went up, up north, right? So the gene flow was mainly from south to north historically. But when we looked at the contemporary population, it had switched. So the northern areas of New Hampshire now are the, are the more productive areas and the main uh, direction of gene flow is going from north to south. And so there's probably a couple reasons for this that, that we hypothesized. One has to do with climate. Um, so it's, it's pretty well documented that New England gets about a foot less snow now than it did in the 1950s. Every year about a foot less snow. And if, uh, and one of the things that limits bobcats at the northern part of their range is snow depth. If they get too much snow, they're going to be outcompeted by their cousin, the Canada lynx, because they have those huge snowshoe paws, right? Um, so in the 1950s, probably a lot of snow up here in the, the northern part of New Hampshire, bobcats couldn't do as well. But now there's a foot less snow on average per year in the northern part. Um, and there's some pretty good habitat, if you remember our habitat suitability map, especially in this area, just north of the whites and around here. So it's a pretty productive area now. Whereas down here, this is sort of the, the population center of the state now. So there's a lot of habitat changes that have happened um, in the southern part of the state that make it less productive, while the northern part of the state, um, because of just climate stuff, is probably more productive. And that's why we saw that switch in the, in the direction of gene flow. Rory, we got a couple questions that have come in. Sure. Uh, Denise asks, how does that habitat uh, information relate to the adjoining states? Is it consistent with New Hampshire or is it different in Maine and Vermont? Um, the, the habitat suitability, is that what you mean? Yeah, the suitability, is it less so? In yeah, um, so we, we would expect it to be similar um, in, in other states, especially, I mean, once we start to get really far away, like most of Vermont is fairly similar to the types of habitats that we have in New Hampshire. Um, once we start to get farther into Maine, you start to get like down east um, or like farther up into Maine, the habitat's very different there. So I, I would hesitate to like extrapolate too much of that, but I would expect the, the, the preferences of bobcats to be fairly similar, um, you know, in, in our immediate surrounding area, yeah. And another question from Scott is, they ask, will the Icarus initiative change how you research bobcat populations in the future? Current studies have shown that bobcats are adapting to urban areas in Connecticut. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure what Icarus is, um, but yeah, so, so urban adaptation um, is, is, a, is a big thing. And absolutely bobcats are, um, you know, getting more and more into cities. And we'll talk about the, the next two phases of the research, talk a little bit about how, how their adaptation and acclimation to, um, to human areas is, is really affecting them. So um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what Icarus is and uh, what, what, that, what um, the person meant by that question, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about urban adaptation. And I had one more question. Um... Wondering about dispersal, whether males typically disperse further than females, if there's any um, difference between the yeah. sexes there. Yeah, so, so females tend to disperse as, as little as possible. Males are, tend to be more long, long distance dispersals, just dispersers. Um, and that's, that's fairly common for a lot of carnivore, for a lot of like highly uh, mobile species. The males tend to be the ones that travel farther. Um, but again, I mean, it, it depends a lot on habitat too. If, if a female, you know, has to, if, if like there's, it's a really dense population and there's not an open habitat available, females can travel really long distances as well, but males tend to travel farther for sure. Good for now. <laughs>
There's one last one about whether if you know of any studies in um, nearby states that show that same kind of subpopulation line like in Vermont or Massachusetts. Yeah, that's actually my next slide. <laughs> what a perfect transition. Um, so, so we did, we, we zoomed out and looked at this at a, at a wider scale. Right, so we got some samples from, um, a few samples from Maine, a few from Massachusetts, quite a few from Quebec, and a lot from Vermont as well. Um, so we see like a similar pattern where like the main division here is this north-south split, um, where these bobcats down in the southern area here are very different from the ones up north. But we found some other, so total we found five different subpopulations. We have, I, I called them, this one is the southern one. This was the biggest population. There's a really unique population right here. I called it the Vermont lowlands. There's a lot of agricultural areas right here. So that population was very unique. Um, and then we had an eastern population over here that kind of went in, up into Maine. Um, the northern population that kind of follows along the Connecticut River Valley here. Um, and then the northwestern population. So overall, we found five different subpopulations. Um, that was, we had, we had trouble getting a, a, a huge number of samples from Maine. I would have really liked to extend this farther just to see, um, but it looks like at least in Western Maine, they're pretty continuous with the sort of Eastern New Hampshire population. Um, so yeah, hopefully that, that answers your question. We did kind of zoom out a little bit um, and I'm not gonna talk too much more about this other than I wanted you to see it because it's gonna come up in, um, in one of the other studies that we talk about. Okay, the other, the last cool thing I want to talk about with the genetic stuff is we looked at effective population size. Um, effective population size is slightly different than census population size. Now, if you want to count the number of bobcats in New Hampshire, that would be a census population. We can look at effective population size, which doesn't count um, individuals who don't contribute to the next generation. So individuals who don't get to breed aren't counted. So um, young individuals, old individuals, um, unlucky individuals um, aren't included in this. So it's not, um, it's not a good way to measure the number of individuals, but it's a good way to compare two different populations. And so we wanted to look at the trajectory in our contemporary populations. Um, so we kind of split each one of those up into an early and a late period and calculated effective population size from our genetic data. And what we found was that in the historic period, they were on a downward trajectory. So effective population size was about 120 individuals in our study area early in the historic period. But by like the early 1960s, the end of our historic period, that was down to about 30 individuals um, for in terms of effective population size. So a pretty stark drop off there. What we found with um, our contemporary population was the exact opposite. So early in the contemporary period, um, our effective population size was higher than it was historically, and it was increasing to the point where we were at about 230 um, in terms of the effective population size by the end of the contemporary period. So further genetic, genetic evidence now that this population is growing and it's very robust. Okay, so one of the other cool things that we found when we compared these two populations, the historic and contemporary populations, we found that contemporary bobcats are much larger. It's kind of a weird thing. We didn't really expect to see that. Um, but for an animal that might only be eight to 10 kilograms, sorry, I'm, I'm working in kilograms, not pounds now, but it might be eight to 10 kilograms on average. Um, they gained about two kilograms in weight over that 50, 60 year period. Um, that's a pretty significant amount of weight, right? So we were thinking that Diet must have um, come into that somehow. So we really wanted to study the diet of bobcats. And we had a few ideas as to why that might be. <laughs> we asked for pictures of bobcats from people all over New Hampshire. If you see a bobcat, take a picture and send it to us. And we got a lot of things like this. They're hanging out under bird feeders because what comes to bird feeders other than birds? Squirrels, right? <laughs> Delicious little, mop, uh, little morsels if you're a bobcat. But we also know that there's a huge number of turkeys in New Hampshire now. Um, there were no turkeys in New Hampshire in 1950. So we thought maybe this is a novel prey source um, that didn't exist in the 50s. Turkeys were extirpated from most of New England. Um, and it's only because of a successful reintroduction program that they're, they're um, there now. 
So we thought maybe this novel prey species, they've learned to just totally exploit this. So maybe they're eating a ton of turkeys and that's why they're so much fatter and happier now, right? So we kind of wanted to, to test those, uh, those two ideas. And we can do that with what are called stable isotopes. Um, I'm gonna give you like the one minute version of stable isotopes, what they are. Essentially, it's just a chemical signal in your food that is detectable in you as well. So if you, a couple of days ago, you went out and you ate a big, big steak dinner, um, I could take a tissue sample from you and a tissue sample from that steak. And I would be able to know that, um, I, I would be able to know what you ate. I'd be able to match up the chemical signal in that steak to the chemical signal in your tissues now. Because essentially at the molecular level, you are what you eat. The atoms and molecules that make up that steak that you ate are the same atoms and molecules that your body uses to build up your own tissues, right? So um, that's basically what stable isotopes are. You are what you eat. So whatever the chemical signature in your food is, that's the chemical signature that's gonna be in you. And so we use two different chemical signatures, a carbon one and a nitrogen one. And what you need to know, carbon, um, the carbon isotope signature represents where you are on this continuum from a very natural food source to an anthropogenic food source. And I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of show you an example in a second. In terms of nitrogen, that's kind of a continuum between um, someone who eats a lot of meat versus someone who eats very little meat. So if this bobcat is eating nothing but rabbits that are eating nothing but grass, it's gonna have a lower nitrogen ratio, no, nitrogen isotope ratio than a bobcat who ate say um, a chipmunk who ate a mouse who was eating nothing but grasses. So it's a higher trophic level up, it's gonna have a higher nitrogen signal. So when you think carbon, think is it natural or is it human subsidy, subsidies? And when you think nitrogen, think is it eating a lot of meat? Is it low, high on the trophic ladder? Or is it eating very little meat? Is it low on the trophic ladder? And so we compared our two populations again, based on these chemical signatures, um, our historic and our contemporary population. And what we found was this. So here on the x-axis, we have our carbon, our carbon, the low values are a very natural diet. The high values are a very uh, human subsidized diet. On our y-axis here, we have our nitrogen signal, which again is a low trophic position and a high trophic position. So they're eating a lot of meat up here or a little meat down here. And what you'll notice is each one of these dots is a, an individual bobcat. The gray dots are the historic ones. The black dots are the, the contemporary ones. And these ovals here represent kind of like the population average. So in terms of nitrogen, not much difference, right? Contemporary bobcats are about the same level on average as the, as the historic bobcats were. So they're not eating at a higher trophic level. They're not eating, um, you know, they're not changing their diet uh, significantly in terms of their trophic position. But you'll see a pretty big shift in the historic bobcats toward this anthropogenic side of the scale, right? So what that tells us is not only are bobcats living near humans, um, but they're benefiting from our presence in the landscape. That's telling us that somewhere in the bobcat food web, um, we, there are human subsidies coming into that, to that food web um, that the bobcats are actually benefiting from. So they have this human subsidies somewhere in that web that bobcats are benefiting from. So that was a, a pretty cool finding. What does that mean in terms of species? Oh, maybe you're getting to that. Like this, no, no, what, is, what is a human subsidy for, you know, what does that mean for species? Is that just things like squirrels and mice and- Yeah, so-, so out your Human garbage or compost bins or- Exactly, yeah. So at some point, um, you know, whether it's a bird or a raccoon or a squirrel, they're benefiting from, from us. And so that, that anthropogenic signal that I keep talking about really comes from corn, right? Like we, we put corn syrup in everything. We feed our, our cattle corn, we feed our chickens corn, uh, we feed you know, bird feeders full of corn, things like that. Um, and corn has that very unique high carbon chemical signal. So at some point in that, um, whether it's squirrels eating corn at a feeder, whether it's turkeys being fed, um, that really high signature is working its way into the food web. And you know, so the, the turkey that eats that corn is gonna have a higher chemical signature. Um, and then when the bobcat eats that turkey, it's also gonna have the higher signature. So um, while I can't really 
based on this research, say exactly where those subsidies are coming from, we do know that, that it's coming from a human source because corn doesn't grow naturally. Corn doesn't naturally occur um, you know, in New England. So. Um, so the other thing we can do, if we know the isotope, the, 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 uh, those um, chemical signatures in a lot of bobcats, and we know the chemical signature in a whole bunch of different prey, we can kind of piece together like a puzzle the relative importance of all these different types of prey in the bobcat's diet. And so that's what we did. And so if you look at um, down here, we have a bunch of different potential prey items, um, lagomorphs, which are rabbits and hares, squirrels, I lumped um, red squirrels, gray squirrels, and chipmunks together. We have large mammals, which were mostly deer, small mammals like mice and voles, um, carnivores, raccoons, fishers, coyotes, poultry, um, so you know people's backyard chickens, and then we have turkeys um, as well. We're surprised to find historically the vast majority of the bobcat diet was rabbits and hares. You know, about 70% of the bobcat diet was rabbits and hares. They ate very few squirrels, some deer in there, uh, you know, some small mammals, no turkeys. That's not a surprise because there were no turkeys in 1950, as I mentioned. But then if we fast forward and look at our contemporary bobcats, a very different diet shows up, right? There's not one major item. They have a much more diverse diet. Squirrels are the main, uh, the, the main part of the diet, um, but there's still a significant amount of lagomorphs and, and deer and, and woodchucks and mice and things like that. So they're like diversifying what they ate. And maybe that's what led to, you know, that, that big increase in size, rather than depending on one single sort of species group, um, they, they sort of diversified. We were really surprised to see that um, turkeys are not really on the menu. Um, we have photographic evidence that bobcats are stalking turkeys through the woods, but, but in terms of, you know, at the population level, we see no evidence that they're actually eating any turkeys. So that was really surprising, surprising to see. Um, and maybe that was just because I was expecting to find, uh, you know, that they were eating turkeys and maybe I just underestimated the ferocity of a turkey. I mean, those, those spurs they have on the back of their legs are, are, are pretty, um, it can be pretty nasty. So maybe a bobcat just doesn't want to get mixed up with that. But yeah, turkeys weren't really on the menu. All right, there's a question about- here, Mostly squirrels now. There was a question about um, the deer. Is this whether a bobcat could actually take down a deer or if they're eating fawns or they, yeah, don't, so they don't scavenge on, on animals that have already died, right? They, they do, um, they, they prefer not to, they will. Um, but deer, um, there was one of my advisors, John Litvitis did a, did a study um, a few years back, well, quite a few years back now, um, where he, he looked at the stomach contents and what he was finding that deer in the bobcat diet was mainly in winter. So when other sources of food for bobcats were relatively scarce and it's really hard for deer to get around well, that was when they were preying on deer. Um, so in terms of like a bobcat taking down a full grown deer, probably extremely rare, maybe a big male could do it, but mostly that's going to happen um, during the winter when deer are sort of at a disadvantage and bobcats are really desperate. Okay, so the other thing we can do with this is, remember I told you that we, we looked at, you know, the, this whole region and all these different subpopulation in the subpopulations in the region. If we do a similar analysis, just looking at the, the percentage of these different species groups in the bobcat diet, but we just look at these subpopulations rather than the whole population, we found that there were differences in what bobcats were eating in each of these different subpopulations. So in, and it basically came down to like three different groups. In the Southern population in the Vermont lowlands, so this kind of area over here, hopefully you can see my cursor there. But in these areas down here, um, that's where the, the bobcat diet was really squirrel heavy. In the Northern areas up here, that's where it was very rabbit and hare, probably snowshoe hares up there, it's very hare heavy. And then the Eastern subpopulation, um, there was kind of a mix of the two. Right, so this was really interesting to see that we found these genetic subpopulations, but it also corresponded to differences in diet. That was really kind of a, a cool finding that we, that we found. Um, and so we looked at in each of these areas, in this, in this southern, this kind of purple rectangle, in these two areas here versus the northern areas, 
what are the major differences on the landscape that might be driving why they're eating you know, big, uh, much more rabbits in the north and much more squirrels in the south? And it turns out that overall, there's not a huge difference in the types of habitat in those areas. They're relatively similar with the exception of agriculture. So agricultural areas in the north um, tended to be a lot more um, cropland. Agricultural areas in the southern parts tended to be a lot more pasture land. So basically like what that kind of pointed out to us is no matter what bobcats are eating, those differences in their prey abundance that they're sort of capitalizing on are driven by our agricultural land uses and how we're, um, how we're sort of uh, you know, growing stuff on the land. Um, so that was a kind, of, kind of an interesting thing that, that we found too. So their diet is changing. It's changed quite a bit over the last I don't know, 60 years or so, 60 or 70 years. And it's really driven now by these agricultural land uses. Okay, so now to this idea of synurbization. So synurbization is a big fancy word that basically just is a way of describing how wildlife species can acclimate and become, they can like learn to, to survive in human dominated areas and they can learn to thrive in those areas as well. So it's, it's kind of an adaptive process. I think someone kind of mentioned this in their question earlier. Um, again, these are all pictures of bobcats that people sent to us from New Hampshire a bobcat's just like living in their in their backyards, like totally happy, stalking prey. Like backyards have everything that they need for a lot of bobcats, right? There's a lot of advantages to living around humans. One of them is a heat island effect. Um, you know, cities, suburban areas, anywhere around people tend to be a degree or two warmer in the winter. So that's a benefit to bobcats, right? It's easier to keep warm if you can live near people. Um, We've already seen how, how living around humans and agriculture can sort of subsidize um, bobcats. So they're, uh, you know, the, the, the prey that they're eating can be, uh, you know, more abundant, more diverse around humans. Um, so this idea of synurbization uh, kind of gets at this idea that it can be a good thing, but it can also um, be a negative thing. And that's where we start to talk about stress. So I think stress gets a bad rap. Like nobody wants to be stressed seen as this like really negative thing but it can actually be pretty um pretty good so um stress is just your body's way of dealing with a challenge right um so if you have to to go out and and give a talk to 200 people you're going to be a little bit stressed out but that's really just your body um mobilizing energy to deal with this thing and then it's going to go back to go back to normal right well the problem is um if you're a mammal when you feel stressed out, your body's releasing cortisol. Cortisol is helping you um, mobilize energy for the short term, but it does that at the expense of a lot of long-term things. So you're going to have, um, if, if you're using all your energy to deal with a stressor in front of you, your immune system has to kind of shut down. Your reproductive systems kind of have to shut down. Your digestion, your growth and healing have to kind of shut down as well. So over really long term, stress can be negative. It's good in the short term, but chronic stress, if you're facing repeated stressors over a really long period of time, can start to have really negative effects. So we wanted to know if bobcats living near humans were experiencing that kind of chronic stress. Interestingly, stress, the cortisol that's pumping through your veins when you're stressed out, is incorporated into your hair. So as your hair is growing, there's a blood supply to the cells that are making your hair and um, that cortisol is actually being incorporated into your hair. So I was able to sample hair from bobcats and figure out how much cortisol was in there and that was a measure of how stressed out they were. We found a couple interesting things. Females are more stressed out than males. A um, couple reasons for this might just be that, you know, we mentioned the, the differences in, um, in sort of home ranges how females are much more protective of their home ranges. So it might just be that sort of added stress of maintaining your home range where males like don't care as much. Uh, that, that could be one thing. There's lots of different things that, that can affect cortisol. Um, so females might just naturally have a, a, higher, um, a higher cortisol level. Um, but there's a lot of things that, that could affect that. But we definitely saw that, that female bobcats have higher cortisol levels. We also saw that, a, we also saw a seasonal difference where stress levels were higher in the fall than they were in the spring. 
and to make sure that this wasn't just you know a natural thing in bobcats we um, tested some captive bobcats from Squam Lakes um, Natural Science Center um, and from the Bed New Bedford Zoo in Massachusetts. Um, and those bobcats showed no difference between spring and fall. But the wild bobcats had elevated stress in the uh, elevated cortisol levels in the fall. So that could just be, um, again, this could be a, a few different things. We're just sort of hypothesizing that it could potentially be um, the winter preparations, right? Like, you know, the winter's coming on, you really have to kind of bulk up as much as you can while you can, that's a stressful event. Um, another idea is that in the spring, there's a, there's a big resource pulse, right? A lot of animals are timing their reproduction to the spring, so there's a lot of babies born in the springtime. And if you're a bobcat, that means lots of tasty, tender morsels, right? But by the fall, they've, the, the tasty tender morsels have been eaten or they've grown up and they're, they're not as naive anymore, right? So it could be a couple different things, but there's definitely a seasonal signal we see there um, where uh, in the fall, the cortisol levels in bobcats are higher. And also landscape matter. So this is where we thought that if there was a lot of human influence on the landscape, if bobcats were living near like heavy human land uses, they're gonna be really stressed out. Um, it's not really what we saw. So um, we have cortisol on the y-axis here. The x-axis is how much of that bobcat's home range is, uh, what percentage of the bobcat's home range is in each of these land use types. So the dark line is wildland urban interface. So you see it kind of is, is relatively low at low levels of an urban interface. It kind of peaks around 50% and then it drops off. So what this is telling us is that if a bobcat's in a completely natural area, it's good. If it's in a really like heavily uh, human influenced area, it can acclimate to that. But it's when it has the challenges of both of those that the, the benefits don't outweigh the risks. So it's sort of that intermediate level of human influence that is the hardest for bobcats. Um, the other factor that was really important was open development. And this was pretty straightforward. More open development meant higher stress. Um, and this is what open development looks like. It's defined as areas that are human developed that are more than 80%. So these are things like golf courses, large parks, cemeteries, things like that. Um, so they're, they're essentially monocultures, right? Like we grow these really large swaths of grass. And if you're a bobcat, that might look like a pasture to you. You might think there's lots of you know, potential prey running around. It might look like good habitat. But essentially, since it's a monoculture, it has a really low um, plant diversity, which leads to really low um, animal diversity, which leads to really low prey. So essentially, it's an ecological trap. The more areas we have that look like this, the higher stress um, that bobcats were experiencing. All right, so why do we care about this? I think I'm going over time a little bit, but this is the last couple of slides. Um, this is, this is all well and good. Everything I've talked about is, you know, is, is great, but it's not conservation. It doesn't really mean anything in terms of, uh, of what we can do about this. It's you know, meticulously researched and analyzed and all this stuff, but um, it doesn't solve any problems. Um, it can create knowledge, but it's what we do with that knowledge that really matters. And as we're um, living our lives on the landscape, we have our, our fingers on a lot of different strings, right? John Muir has this great quote. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So when we're developing our landscapes, when we're building a road, when we're um, you know, building our houses, when we're managing our forests, we don't intend to fragment habitat and divide populations. We don't intend to alter uh, you know, prey communities for any species. We don't intend to stress out bobcats. But when we're pulling on those strings, we find them connected to everything else, right? So we're doing these things, and these are the unintentional consequences um, that that can happen. That, that can happen when we do these things in the landscape. So, in terms of what we can do about all this, I know I'm probably preaching to the choir. You guys are all here because you're conservation-minded people, right? But it doesn't hurt to to understand that the land that we live on, the land that we own is not solely ours, right? We're sharing this landscape and everything we do 
is going to have deep rippling effects through the ecological communities that, that we're living in, right? Um, so I think I kind of put this list together um, with uh, trying to keep in mind that the impacts that we have are often greater than we realize in a lot of ways, negative and positive, right? Um, when we develop, like I said, it's gonna have rippling effects through the other species that, were, that are inhabiting the same landscapes, but also the things that we can do personally from a conservation ethic standpoint, um, conserving water, um, eating less meat, planting native plants, those things can go a long way too and they can have some really positive rippling effects through our, through our environment. Um, so, and for God's sake, keep your cats inside. If there's one thing you can do if you're a wildlife lover is don't have an outdoor cat. They kill billions of songbirds every year, billions with a B. Um, so I, I kind of put together this list, um, you know, just to, to kind of help you realize that the little things that we do actually can make a big impact. Um, and hopefully that's a kind of a positive message to end on. <laughs> and I have a lot of people to thank. Um, especially my little naturalist in training down here, Oscar. Um, but if there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them. I know I went a little over, I apologize. Thank you so much, Roy. That was so informative and fantastic. And we're really grateful for your time and your expertise. I did see one, at least one question. There may be some that filter in. Someone was asking where they should send photos, bobcat photos. I know if you, I don't know if you know, I know there was a time at which New Hampshire, UNH was collecting them as part of a study. I don't know if they are anymore. Do you know? If yeah, someone has a um, little bobcat picture and they want to, I have one answer to that for fish and game, but I didn't know if, if, if you know if UNH is still collecting them. Yeah, UNH is not collecting them anymore. Yeah. We kind of stopped that. Like that was, that was part of the research when we were looking at their habitat. We wanted to see if we could use photos submitted by the public as a way to like see where in the state bobcats were, but it just turned out they were pretty much everywhere. everywhere. Um, so, um, so yeah, UNH is not doing that anymore, but. I will say that there in New Hampshire, there is um, a website that's run through Fish and Game and UNH called New Hampshire Wildlife Sightings. You have to have a login, but it's free. You can make a login and then you can report. It initially started just for herps, for reptiles and amphibians, but they've expanded it to include mammals and also all rare species. So if you want Fish and Game to know about the bobcat sighting, you can, you can create a login there. If you have a super cool bobcat photo from around the Monadnock region and you want to share it with a wider audience, you can always send it to me at um, or one of the other Harris or Miles at the Harris Center, and um, you know we can share them on social media just for fun, if, with your permission and with photo credit to you. But if you want, to, if you're thinking about it in terms of data, um, the Fish and Game New Hampshire Wildlife Sightings is a place where you can share them, um, and particularly I would say road roadkill, not just for bobcats but for other mammals. Um, trying to figure out spots where they're not able to make it across roads is kind of an up and coming field of interest. And there are bobcats that people find on roads. And if you see one and submit a picture of that, I think there could be real conservation value in the long term. There's also um, iNaturalist if you're, if you're into the, the yes. smartphones and stuff like that. If you have a really great picture, um, you have a location, um, you can upload that there. And there's a, like, I think that's kind of a, you know, a wave of the future in, in wildlife research. There's a lot of really good observations on it, like millions and millions and millions of observations that, that researchers can use when, when they're trying to study things like how species ranges are shifting, particularly with climate change. So um, I upload a lot of stuff on iNaturalist and um, yeah, I definitely recommend if you're, if you're into the whole smartphone app thing, then definitely. Couple questions from the live stream. Is there a legal hunting season for bobcat in New Hampshire? And if so, is that affecting the population? Uh, there's not. They've actually been um, a protected species since 1983. Um, there was an effort a few years ago to try to open a season that ultimately was, was kind of shut down. Um, but there are harvest seasons in all the states around us. So Quebec, Maine, Massachusetts, and Vermont, there are, um, there are seasons on them. Um, I'd be surprised if in, in the next, you know, five or 10 years, the issue doesn't come up again. And, and maybe there is, there is a season, but it was pretty, it was pretty widely pressed. There's a lot of people that were, that were very um, opposed to the, to the idea of opening it up. Um, 
So yeah, cur currently they're, they're still protected species. But we, New Hampshire has a long history, like for most of the last 200 years, there's been a bounty on bobcats. So um, this, this protection is, is a relatively recent thing in terms of New Hampshire history. But. Also, Adela was curious on collecting the data for the carbon and nitrogen mapping. How did you sample the, the bobcat tissue? Um, so we took their hair. Um, so, so again, the, that chemical signal is, is incorporated into hair. And hair is cool because it kind of records like a, a temporal signal as well. So I could like take one of my long hairs from my COVID coiffure here. Um, <laughs> and I could see like, you know, this is what I ate last month. This is what I ate the month before and the month before and the month before and the month before. So you can kind of like keep a record of how diet is changing um, as well. So yeah, we, we sampled their hair. Um, and hair from a bunch of their different prey and kind of piece together, um, you know, what the most likely importance of all those different species was. How was that hair collected? Um, so a couple different ways. So in Vermont, they have, they have a bobcat harvest season and they, they have a really great program over there where um, they invite a whole bunch of scientists to come and and do um, autopsies necropsies on all these bobcats um, every bobcat that's harvested goes to you know to fish and wildlife to study but also they invite all these scientists um, and I would go every year and spend a whole day going through and collecting um, hair and other tissues from these bobcats there were other scientists there who were studying parasites so they were taking like liver samples um, I can't speak highly enough of, of Vermont and that program that they have um, it's just a wealth of information. And I, my hope would be that if New Hampshire ever does open a season, they would do something similar because there's a lot we can learn um, from, from programs like that that, um, that we can't learn elsewhere. So, so Vermont, I got it from, from those, um, those sessions that they did. And um, in New Hampshire, um, if any trapper incidentally caught a bobcat, um, I, I would work with Fish and Game to get those samples from roadkill samples. Um, any, basically any time a biologist in New Hampshire came into contact with a bobcat, they were taking samples for me. You know, and I will add to that, some people on this may know that people tend to bring dead animals to the Harris Center or at least call us and ask if we can use their dead animals, um, primarily for taxidermy mounts for teaching. And um, we, we, all of the bobcats, we haven't had many, but in the last few years, there's been a couple that have come our way. They we don't mount them, we can't mount them, we don't have permission, they go to Fish and Game so that they can get tissue samples like the ones that Rory's describing, they go straight to Fish and Game from us. Sometimes we're the ones who, who bring, will bring the bobcat there, but um, there was another question about to what degree foxes and fishers might compete with bobcats for prey? Um, it's very likely that, that they're pretty, um, pretty strong competitors. Um, especially bobcats and fishers, they're sort of notoriously, um, you know, have a notorious dislike for one another. Um, a lot of times, you know, if a, if a bobcat or a fisher encounters the young of the opposite species, they'll kill it. Um, so a lot, a lot of competition there. Um, with foxes, um, I think that that would depend on the habitat. I mean, there's lots, like especially red foxes that like to live in, in human uh, sort of areas as well. I would imagine they're competitors, but there's a lot of research out there that shows when you have two similar species that are they're at least eating similar things, like a bobcat and a red fox, they tend to find ways to limit that competition, right? So um, maybe the bobcat will forage later at night and the, and the fox will forage earlier in the evening. So they're like sort of limiting that direct competition that they have. Um, but yeah, they're definitely after a lot of the, the same prey species. Um, you know, life is hard, like I said, in the wild. And so I think most species tend to avoid conflict if at all possible. And so that's why they, they do things like, um, you know, that they call it's called temporal partitioning, where one will forage, one will use an area later in the day, one will use it earlier in the day, or they could just, you know, decide to, to use different areas um, altogether and, and not spatially overlap too. So there's lots of ways to limit that competition, but it's definitely there. Miles, are there any more? I think we're done with our questions from the chat here. Was there any last question from the YouTube? There, there are more questions. Um, 
but I want to be mindful of your time. I know it's getting late. Yes. <laughs> okay. I, maybe one last question and then we'll wrap it up. There's a question from Jim. What are the preferred denning sites? Are there south facing cliffs? Are there certain orientations that they prefer? Yes, absolutely. South facing slopes was a, was another key thing in our in our habitat model that we built. Um, so it's typically like those those rocky, craggy areas and south facing slopes were the two biggest things just in um, just in terms of, of den sites. Yeah. Wonderful. And so you know sometimes they'll they'll um, maybe not like a denning site, but you know bobcats are good climbers. They'll kind of hang out in a in a tree, sleep in a tree too. So you know big um, another one. Um, I've seen quite a lot of bobcat tracks that kind of go under fallen trees and uh, you know, they'll kind of make a den under a, a big fallen tree, stuff like that, so. Well, I just wanna thank Rory again. If, if we were all together in person, you'd hear us all clapping for you and it'd be thunderous applause, but there's um, a million thank yous have come in on the chat. It's, it was a really incredibly informative and we, we're really grateful for your time and your expertise. Um, and for zooming in all the way from down south. So yeah, thank I'm you happy. again, Rory. And thanks to everyone for joining us. We really um, are glad that you're here and we'll see you thank next you. time. Thank you. Happy to do it. Thanks. Thanks for